Hello and welcome to lecture one of the Stevenson School for Ministry course, Theological Reflection, Living and Thinking Through the Lens of Theology. And today we're going to look at how religious beliefs are formed and developed. You'll remember last weekend in Danville, we looked at the importance of theology. Uh, we saw that the, you know pretty much everybody is a theologian. Everybody has theological questions which they ask themselves and they each have uh, ideas for how to answer those questions. But we looked at how we as people who are called either to lay leadership in the parish church or eventually to ordained leadership have a special task uh, which is to be deliberate theologians, not just the ordinary theologians of the rest of the congregation. And you remember that we looked at how we, uh, as a, in our calling, are called to stand in the gap between the academy, uh, the place of of full time professional theological study and the rigor of that, and the parish. Uh, and we are to be interpreters uh, of, of theology uh, in between those two places. So today, uh, how do people uh, come to their religious beliefs and, uh, and, and how do they change those beliefs? These are important questions. Uh, and now you, you, you might think, well, you know, it's, it's very easy, uh, you know, how, how people um, come to their beliefs. They, they kind of hear a proposition or they uh, think about an issue for themselves and then they sit down and they think about it. They consider the evidence for a particular viewpoint. Uh, they balance the probabilities of whether this proposition is true or not. And then they make a decision on what to believe. Well, if that is how you think people form their religious beliefs, uh, you're probably wrong, uh, because I don't think anybody actually goes through that kind of scientific uh, method of, of what shall I believe? Uh, you know, we're not talking about a scientific experiment, which we can do in a laboratory under very controlled conditions um, and then observe uh, some findings and then you know make a, a rational decision based on our observations uh, it's much more complex than that people are not just scientific brains um, and we'll see in this lecture that uh, that, that 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 systematic uh, scientific way of, of arriving at belief uh, really isn't true when it comes to things like religion and uh, and indeed philosophy
the, the, the phrase uh, that I've taken, you know, why we believe what we believe is actually the title of a book by a neuroscientist called Andrew Newberg. Um, so that is the title of the book. If you want to get a hold of it, it's uh, I warn you, it's very dense. It's quite difficult to read, particularly if you're not a scientist. Uh, I'm not a scientist and I did kind of struggle with it. But um, that's the title that he as a, a neuroscientist um, finds quite interesting. Uh, you know, what goes on in the brain when we uh, change our beliefs or when we, we form beliefs in some way. And he describes or defines at least belief as this. Belief is any perception, cognition or emotion that the brain assumes unconsciously or consciously to be true. Now, let's just unpack that a little bit, because each of those words, I think, needs some explanation. A perception, says Newberg, is the information we receive through our senses, you know, the stuff that we see and hear uh, and touch uh, and taste. Um, you know, through through our senses. That's what we perceive. You know, someone talks to us, we read something, we're perceiving some information. Cognition uh, is a little more complex than that. Uh, and, and cognition is the, the abstract processes of the brain that um, uh, that include memories and experience. So this is not stuff that you receive from your your five senses. Um, it's it's things that that we apply to what we receive through the five senses, and it's much more complex because it's it's our personal experiences and memories, uh, those abstract processes. So there's a there's an interaction here of the stuff we receive plus you know we're starting to do some interpretation of what we perceive uh, based on these other factors like our memory and our experience. And then uh, that word emotion, well, you, you know what that means. Uh, and emotions um, help us to, to attach value to those uh, perceptions and, uh, and cognitive experiences. So uh, there's an interplay there of three things uh, and it's quite complex. And that's uh, how we receive our information. We're receiving it, but we're also interpreting it based on our memories uh, and our feelings really. Now, Newberg says, you know, it's not as simple as that even, you know, like we sit in this, you know, this isolated room and, and we do all this thing because we do all this as part of a community. And that could be as small as the community of your uh, family, uh, your friends uh, or in this huge social context like your nation. So we 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 pick up lots of um, uh, means by which we receive information from the community we live in. So there is this social context and without adequate social consensus, uh, our beliefs may actually never make it into our consciousness. So there are these four um, spheres of influence, perception, cognition, emotion and social consensus and they allow us to uh, identify, explore, evaluate and compare a wide variety of beliefs. So let's just use an example because that's really quite um, quite a heavy kind of section that I've just been talking about. Say that a stranger tells you you're a millionaire. Uh, this is Newberg's example, I should say. Uh, a stranger tells you you're a, mil a millionaire. Now your emotional reaction to that uh, is yeah fantastic brilliant I'm, I'm a millionaire uh, but your cognitive skills will tell you this is false because people just don't tell you that you know you're a millionaire uh, and your memory and experience um, sort of works on the perception you know the the statement that you've been told you are a millionaire uh, your memory and, and experience tells you well this just doesn't happen so it can't be true uh, so your emotions however uh, loudly they're speaking to you with excitement uh, eventually your your cognition um, tells you that your emotions are incorrect but if the stranger then hands you a check for a million dollars then you have a stronger emotional reaction. You know, there's there's actual kind of real evidence here. There's a, there's, a, there's someone standing here with a check, uh, but still your cognition uh, will be saying, well, what's the catch? You know, 
Uh, people don't just hand me a check for a million dollars. There's a catch here. Uh, I can't believe this to be true. Uh, now, say you then take the check and you go to the bank and the bank confirms it's genuine. Hmm. Then uh, you begin to think, well, this might be true. Your emotions are, are really peaking here, telling you to get very excited. And your cognition is now beginning to think, well, um, you know, uh, I, I trust banks when they tell me that a check is valid. So I'm starting to think that this may be true, even though, you know, this kind of thing's never happened before. But then if this stranger who's given you this million dollars turns out to be an attorney executing the will of your long lost billionaire uncle, then all the pieces, perception, cognition, emotional value and social consensus come together and you begin to believe that you are now a millionaire. So. All this suggests that a person's religious upbringing or early experience will strongly influence their belief in God, that cognition thing, that, that memory and experience. We are, in a sense, through our early years in life, conditioned uh, to, to either believe certain things or disbelieve certain things, just by that, that, that social consensus uh, and, and the way that works on our cognition and, uh, and our emotions as it, as it reinterprets or interprets our perceptions. So Newberg uh, actually says, well, there are actually seven billion belief systems in the world <laughs> and each one is changing slightly. So an idea here, which is uh, one that, that is certainly true, and, and Newberg and other neuroscientists would, would say this is very definitely the case, you know, our brains actually change. Um, we can uh, receive, you know, experience a, a change in the, the, the neuroscience uh, of, of our brains. Um, in, in response to certain experiences. So uh, believing, uh, when we change beliefs, it's not just this kind of spiritual or emotional thing. Our brains do actually change um, in, their, in their structure. Brains are plastic. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that, you know, they're, <laughs> obviously they're not made of plastic, but that means that they are kind of elastic. They can be molded. Um, uh, they change in response to use.
Now, here's something on the human brain, uh, what actually happens in the human brain. Uh, there are, if you like, three parts to the human brain. There is the reptile part. It's called the basal ganglia. And that is what, you know, what you would have in a, in a very simple animal like a reptile. Um, so it's all about basic instincts. You know, there's no, no real thought about any of this. You, you just have this, 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 this instinctive reaction. Uh, and it's, it's usually the, the, the fight or flight uh, reaction or the, uh, you know, the, re, uh, the, the impulse to eat, uh, the impulse to reproduce uh, and those sorts of things. So uh, that's a very, very ancient part of our brains as, as, they, as they evolved into the complex things they are now. There is the mammalian brain, which is called the amygdala. Uh, it's more complex than the reptilian brain. And that's the part of the brain that, uh, that is responsible for memory and emotions. And it responds extremely quickly. Um, in fact, 80,000 times faster than the third part of the brain, which we're going to look at in just a second. Now, uh, people who have very well developed amygdala uh, usually operate out of a, a quite an emotional field uh, in life. So they react um, to, to events and to situations uh, quite quickly um, and uh, perhaps find it difficult to uh, to to think um, <clears throat> excuse me, to think logically about things um, without kind of becoming um, very emotional uh, in their reaction. Um, so so all mammals uh, have this um, and, uh, you know, it's 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 the, the, the kind of the memory aspect uh, of life is uh, is what we're talking about here. Then there is the executive part of the brain, the neocortex, the final part of the brain to evolve. And it what's, it's what distinguishes us from, uh, from mammals, uh, neuroscientists would say. So this is the part of the brain where you're able to analyze, where you can be objective, you can examine your own emotions rather than just reacting to them. Um, re it's rational, there's foresight, uh, there's self-awareness. Um, now this 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 kicks in much more slowly than the mammalian amygdala brain. So um, you know the skill for those of us who are seeking to understand ourselves and to mature in life, uh, the secret is to uh, to somehow you know not respond with all amygdala to to a crisis or to a situation, uh, but to step back and and respond with the executive, the neocortex. Um, and if you can't do that, uh, then, you know, things like, you know, reactivity, um, you know, unstable relationships, uh, you know, people losing their temper very quickly, people getting scared and, and reacting, becoming defensive. Um, you know, that's the person who's perhaps slightly too large on amygdala, slightly um, underdeveloped on neocortex. And uh, interestingly, the part that regulates religious belief is located in the neocortex because you know we are the only uh, mammals who um uh, you know who have religious beliefs and who have that impulse to, to kind of worship and to make connection um with um uh with with what's out there uh, the transcendent so brains are then plastic they change in structure uh, and so the part of the brain that regulates religious belief also changes so you can grow in faith uh, and actually you can you can probably regress in faith as well you can go from being an, an an unbeliever to being a believer in in certain propositions
And here's what, what Newberg says about this, this whole thing. Uh, brains can change uh, in response to prayer and spiritual practice. And what happens in the brain when, when a human being prays and practices things like meditation um, and uh, contemplative prayer, th there will actually be a change in the, the neurology of the brain which will result in the parts of the brain that um, all light up in conditions of stress and anxiety. Uh, those, those parts of the brain will not light up so much. So, so scientific proof from Newberg that prayer, meditation and so forth does actually reduce stress and anxiety. You know, we all know it. Uh, it's not just Christians who know that. You know, anyone who practices any kind of the Eastern meditative practices and mindfulness and so forth, you know, everyone will attend to this that you know when I pray when I'm in a, a habit of prayer meditation um, you know I, I'm just more in charge of my emotions uh, I feel more peaceful less stressed and so forth and Newberg in his research would say that just 12 minutes of meditation a day uh, may slow down the aging process of the brain it is however important what your meditating on what you're contemplating yeah he says that you know uh, a loving god if that's what you're focused on then anxiety depression stress will reduce uh, security compassion and love feelings will increase but if you're if the god you are meditating on is an angry resentful violent god um you know who uh, who is kind of smiting people everywhere and you should live in fear of such a god then you know however much you contemplate god you're not going to develop those th those moods of of um of, of, of uh, security and compassion and love so intense prayer and meditation permanently change structures and functions in the brain they, it alters your values and the way you perceive reality and i think that's very encouraging for those of us in Christian ministry who believe in the power of the gospel to change people's lives uh, you know there's scientific evidence for that to be true
so that's that's new uh, that's neuroscience and and i think that's very interesting you know uh, just to, to provide the basis for uh, what i'm going to say now you know that there is scientific evidence that we do change we do develop um, and uh, that includes our religious convictions as well now we're going to move on to a pedagogical uh, survey uh, and and pedagogy is is really how people learn um, and how they change and develop so we're going to look at some um, educationalists and some social scientists and see what they would say uh, which will complement um, Newberg and uh, neuroscientists uh, and the perhaps the main uh, voice in 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 this particular aspect of social science and and the development uh, of faith and moral reasoning is James Fowler and Fowler was professor of theology and human development at Emory University and uh, director of the Center for Research on Faith and Moral Development and the Center for Ethics um, he is a or was at least he died just a couple of years ago um, he was a United Methodist Church minister so he comes at this from a place of faith and also a place of experience of having served parishes where he uh, was able to form something of his um, of his foundational thoughts on these issues and the book that he wrote which really uh, set the gold standard for for research into how people grow in their faith and moral reasoning uh, was called stages of faith and it was published in 1981 and he says that there are seven stages um, and we'll we'll look at those right now There is a, a primal or undifferentiated faith and 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 Fowler says this is typical of, of infants before before the age of three. Um, now, at this stage, an infant uh, experiences, it is ho hopefully experiences uh, nurture and safety. And and as a result of that, the infant learns to trust his or her carers and to feel secure in uh, his or her environment. So Fowler says this creates a foundation which makes a child predisposed to develop a faith in God. That kind of, uh, you know, I have faith that my uh, mother or father is going to care for me um, means that I will have faith, I'll be predisposed to trust that there is a God who will care for me as well. And if um, uh, if, if I have that, that, that solid foundation, faith will be much more easy. However, the opposite is the true is the truth. Uh, and, um, you know, if, if a, a, an infant's carers and if their environment is not conducive to developing trust, then the child is predisposed to not having faith in God. Next, says Fowler, is the intuitive projective faith, and this is young children between the ages of three and seven, typically. And here, at this stage, a child will be stimulated by stories and symbols, uh, but will not be able to logically process them. So, uh, you know, we've, we, if you have a child in your life, you, you will, uh, you know, read that child a story, um, a child between the ages of three to seven. Uh, the child will become captivated by the story, will love the story. Uh, you know, <laughs> every night the child will want that same story read to them. Um, and so they're, they're really kind of exploring this aspect of their, of their, their psyche, which, uh, which connects with symbols, um, connects with, with, with great story themes. Um, and that's fantastic, although they can't analyze those stories just yet. So imagination is beginning to take shape at this part of a, a child's life. And uh, this, uh, of course, is based on, on feelings um, and, and images which create a powerful uh, and long lasting understanding of, of, of the child's universe. So through the stories and the symbols that the child is is dealing with, is experiencing, so that child is beginning to make assumptions about the universe uh, in which the child um, lives. 
The third uh, level of, of uh, faith uh, in, um, in Fowler is the mythic literal faith. And this is uh, in school age uh, children, uh, sort of uh, younger school age children. And here, a child will develop an understanding of an ordered physical and moral universe. OK, they're starting to have a perception of, of the laws of the universe, including moral laws and laws of justice. So they're learning that actions have consequences. And at this stage of life, a, a child's view of God is that God is is judicial by nature. Uh, God has a, a sense of right and wrong. Uh, if you do good things, you're rewarded. If you do bad things, you're punished. Uh, God is usually anthropomorphic. In other words, you know, God has human attributes, both emotionally and, and even physically as well. Uh, number four, uh, the synthetic uh, or conventional faith. And this is what happens to, to adolescents. Um, so you all know, uh, you know, there is for most adolescents a crisis of, of confidence in the religious beliefs that the, 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 the young person has been taught in their life. So there's a growing self-awareness here and the need to integrate uh, the personal identity with the identity of other people as as children grow up into a community. So uh, uh, an adolescent will learn that their perceptions are not shared by everyone and that for the health of the community, there has to be conformity around certain foundational ideas. So there's uh, there's a recognition that, you know, you know, I believe in God, but, you know, the kid at the next desk doesn't. Uh, so somehow we have to kind of coexist in, in the community of this classroom. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a development there in, in adolescent thinking. Uh, then there is the individuative reflective faith, which uh, usually arises from mid 20s to late 30s. Uh, from this, you'll, you'll gather that that young people's brains have not con have not finished developing until usually their their early mid twenties, um, which is a fascinating idea, uh, and uh, really raises serious questions about adolescents driving cars and and things like that. So at this stage, uh, we're all about angst and struggle. Um, and during this time, a person uh, learns to take personal responsibility for his or her beliefs and feelings. Uh, it's marked by critical self-reflection and a person examines their ideas and beliefs that they've received from other people, you know, carers, important people in their, their childhoods. And, and they begin to create their own personal faith life. Um, so, so great questioning, um, you know, personal crisis very often as a young, a young adult will move from a position of faith to agnosticism or, or even, you know, the other way from, from atheism towards faith. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a big internal thing going on uh, uh, amongst young people. Um, now, uh, positively, on the, in, in, in this, this, this time of life, you know, there's a growing ability to empathize with others um, uh, as well as be kind of very self-reflective and see whether, you know, my faith is, is good for me. Does it work for me and for my community? Then there is conjunctive faith, which is um, typical, <laughs> typical of the midlife crisis, really. So there's an acknowledgement at this stage of life of paradox and transcendence uh, that is beyond our, our symbols and our stories and our inherited systems. So you often find people, you know, in their, their, their 40s, 50s, um, you know, going through a very significant period of self-doubt. Uh, and and wondering, you know, what their life really means of all the stuff that they have been relying on thus far, you know, doesn't seem to be meeting their needs anymore. 
So um, a healthy midlife crisis, I, I, uh, Fowler would say, was, you know, uh, you, in this stage, you embrace um, paradox and mystery. So you, you, you start to be content with not knowing uh, all the answers and um, you start to be uh, just peaceful with the idea that, you know, you can't work out who God is. Maybe you can't even work out what the purpose of your life is, uh, but actually, you know, you can continue to live a, a fruitful, healthy life, even with those those kind of questions. So symbols, stories, even language at this stage are, are, are not necessarily the truth with a capital T, but vehicles for expressing the truth. And then Fowler would say the final um, place that, 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 a, that a healthy human being uh, would reach as they develop is universalizing faith, um, you know, enlightenment, uh, some people might call it. And this is a state of existence in which uh, the person is, is grounded in unity with God. Um, so one's life is marked by uh, passionate but detached love, which overcomes divisions, injustice, violence and so forth. Now, uh, Fowler says, and this is this is very helpful for us, uh, and we know this to be true, but Fowler says that this is not a natural thing. You know, it isn't like a, a person as they go through these various stages of uh, the ages of life will automatically uh, you know, develop uh, and mature in this way. So some people will get stuck uh, in in um, uh, in what you know one of the early stages and live their whole life there. And we know this to be true, don't we? We know we find people who are you know perhaps well advanced in years who still have you know the the mythic literal faith. Uh, of uh, of a school child, um, you know, somebody who is you know intolerant of what other people think, uh, think of things very black and white, aren't able to make connections between symbols and the reality that that symbol symbolizes. Um, so so you know you can look around your your own circle of friends, maybe your own parish, and just see you know yeah that person there you know they've really kind of gone through these stages and they are a mature person and and they're at level you know five or six and and others uh, you know perhaps at level you know uh, two three four. You can even plot yourself on here. Now Fowler would say that stage seven there is is practically never reached. Uh, in fact, you know, probably isn't reached by anybody. Uh, he would say that, uh, you know, the goal is is to, to aim for for universalizing faith. But actually, you know, may, maybe Jesus, you know, maybe, you know, one or two other, you know, highly enlightened people in, in history have made it to number seven. But, you know, this isn't a way in which people beat themselves up, you know, uh, but to be uh, to be, you know, content with where they are while also uh, working consistently at maturity. <clears throat> so that's James Fowler, and that was groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking work that he did there in the early 80s.
Uh, some people have analysed Fowler and not been particularly generous towards him. Uh, they've accused him of, um, of being kind of elitist. Um, they, they, they would say that, yeah, OK, so Fowler, where are you in this? You know, presumably you're number seven because you're so wise and mature that you can see where everybody else is and come up with this uh, very detailed uh, scheme of understanding, uh, you know, people's maturity and human nature. So uh, his critics would say this is value laden, you know, that some things are good and some things are bad. And if you happen to fit into the bad part, well, you know, bad on you. And I, and I think I'm going to understand that that point, really. Um, and so, you know, what does actually number number seven, number six look like? Well, you know, is it Fowler? You know, <laughs> is Fowler, you know, the, the king? Is Fowler God? Because this is what Fowler has said. Uh, and some people would say, well, you know, number number seven uh, is is so perfect in Fowler's view, but that perfection actually dis removes people's distinctiveness. There is this kind of merging of faiths and cultures and experiences into something which is, you can't really define, but it actually makes um, individual believers like a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu or a Sikh, you know, less mature than someone who has reached this view that everything is one just merged uh, thing where, you know, m m where maturity really happens and there's no distinction between anybody else. Now, as a Christian, I would want to say, well, it, does my maturity mean that I stop believing in the uniqueness of Jesus and start to believe that everybody's philosophy and religion is the same and we just become this one big merged philosophy and is that perfection? And I got to say, no, you know, I, I don't think that personally, as I mature in my faith, that will mean I think less of Jesus. Um, I might think more of some other religious figures, um, but I, you know, for me, maturity does not mean, you know, that I become less of a Christian and more of a universal philosophical adherent. Um, so, so I can see, you know, that analysis of Fowler, that criticism, you know, to me carries some kind of weight.
Fowler was uh, an associate of a man called John Westerhoff, um, who, who did some very good work uh, developing Fowler and making it um, slightly uh, simplified. So uh, Westerhoff comes up with three, um, three stages of faith. There is, he would say, experienced faith. And this is when a young child um, will learn purely by osmosis, just by being around people. Um, so they will learn that God, worship and community are important. Uh, or they will not learn that for the child that grows up in an environment where those things are not a feature. So attending church and receiving verbal and nonverbal messages from parents and others will be foundational experiences that establish a child's faith. Uh, like Fowler, he says, you know, it's not always people move beyond this stage, but if they do um, successfully uh, transition from the, the first stage, they will join or, or, or attain affiliative faith. And during that time, a young person will make a personal decision to be a member of the faith community. So in our liturgical tradition, our, our um, pedo-baptist tradition, we would say that that would be a time for confirmation. Um, you know, at the earliest 12 and, you know, Ideally, perhaps a little bit later when when young people have a slightly more uh, mature uh, capacity to to make that decision for themselves. In Baptist traditions, of course, that would be the, a, a moment for for believers baptism. So that's affiliative faith. And then if they successfully um, transition there, uh, there will be searching faith. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? You'd think that his third stage would be a more uh, robust and um, and convinced faith. Actually, Westerhoff says the opposite. Um, the the mature faith for Westerhoff is um, it's value. It's it's characterized by by critical judgment, experimentation, doubt, but also this this commitment to uh, to grand causes in life. So those are two um, very good, I think, uh, stages or, or, or schemes of how people develop. In
faith. Uh, a third one is uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, and he had six stages of moral reasoning. So this isn't now about uh, the development of faith. It's about moral reasoning. Uh, and this, I think, is, is fascinating for us. And I think, you know, we see the reality of Kohlberg's theory in our own parishes. Uh, there is there is a level of moral reasoning which is based on obedience and punishment. So the, the key motive here for, for this believer is how can I avoid being punished? Uh, now, you'd think, you know, that's a very early childlike thing that equates with Fowler's, you know, stage, you know, two or something. Um, but but I, I think I know Christians, adults who, who are in this stage where, you know, what really matters in my faith is, is, is God going to punish me uh, or is God going to reward me? And uh, that's not really a very mature uh, place to be in your faith. It's followed by a self-interest orientation so so what's in it for me um you know uh, okay i'll be good i will obey the teachings of the church and the bible um because of the good things that uh, that i will get out of it then there's an interpersonal accord and conformity uh, which is what Kohlberg calls it that essentially is the um the recognition that there are social norms um, and, and that there might not be, you know, there are no rewards and punishments in these social norms. This is about how I will feel. OK, so it's so it's 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 more mature. It's about, OK, how am I going to feel peaceful with myself if I do A, B and C? Uh, am I going to feel kind of um, unhappy with myself if I commit this particular sin. So it's not about I must obey. It's about what is this going to be? What is this going to mean to me uh, as I try to live my life? So am I going to feel good about myself or am I going to feel bad about myself? Will this affect my relationships? Um, I want to be liked. I want to be well thought of. If I do this act, will that happen or will people think ill of me? So it's more mature, not excessively mature but it's getting there and fourth uh, authority and social order maintaining so uh, law and order morality uh, individual approval is not important if you think i'm a good or bad person doesn't matter uh, what matters is i'm functioning happily in society and society is functioning well because of me so we obey the laws, not because I feel good when I obey the law, but because I have a responsibility to the wider community um, uh, and uh, by, by, by obeying the law. The social contract orientation, which is number five. So we're getting into, you know, mature people now, uh, Kohlberg would say. And this is not about external forces at all, but by being accountable to one's own values having integrity so i'm going to do the right thing uh, just because that's what i do you know i am a good person you know i have integrity these are the values that i have and whether society approves of them or not whether the law approves of them or not uh, whether god approves of them or not this is what i am going to do because i'm going to have integrity within myself and live up to my own standards and be accountable for my own behavior and Kohlberg says most people never reach here. Um, now, one of the th things here is a mutual uh, accept uh, acceptance. So, so we accept each other when we are in this stage. It's like, okay, so your morality is not the same as mine, uh, but you know, who cares? You know, it's you have to have integrity for yourself. Uh, you have to be, live up to your own values, have your own accountability, and even if that means obeying society's norms, then. Uh, that is good because you're having integrity uh, for yourself. And finally, universal ethical principles. So um, so this is the peak and it's all about having deep principles that guide your conscience. Uh, and empathy is a big thing here, not just kind of uh, feeling sorry for people who are suffering, but the, the, the ability to think your way 
into other people's shoes to feel genuinely what it must be like to be them in both a, a suffering but also a joyful kind of way. Uh, I think that's pretty useful from Kohlberg. And again, you know, we know people at each of these stages, I've no doubt. Now, uh, that hasn't, hasn't been universally accepted.
Um, somebody called Carol Gilligan um, has done some very helpful analysis of Kohlberg, and uh, she comes up with some really interesting points. Uh, she says that that this 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 um, system, Kohlberg system in particular, is a, a very anthropocentric one. In other words, it's it's a male oriented scheme. It's written by a man uh, and it, it views life and development and growth uh, through through the male lens. So she says uh, that uh, as children, boys and girls, are taught different things. Um, for a boy, uh, the, the goal is to separate from particularly one's mother, but eventually also from one's birth family, to become independent and then to begin one's own family. Um, for a girl, she says, you know, what, what you learn is different. Uh, what you learn is the value of intimacy and the value of attachment, uh, the value of being part of a community of, of interdependence. And this is neither good nor bad. You know, one isn't better than the other. It's just different. Um, so she says that um, um, men uh, are usually threatened, or his male identity is usually threatened by intimacy and female identity is threatened by separation. Uh, really interesting stuff. I, I find this, uh, and uh, and personally, I, I you know I, I suspect this is probably true from uh, from my own experience and the interest uh, the, the experience of those people I know um, and uh, and love. Um, so she says that uh, because these these developmental theorists like Fowler and particularly Kohlberg are male, they have a natural bias to seeing maturity through male eyes and therefore separation and independence are seen as being mature. But for uh, a woman, separation is not mature, um, community is mature. So that's a really interesting challenge, I think, that, that Gilligan uh, uh, issues to Kohlberg. So is failure to separate from one's mother a developmental deficit? Um, for a, for a, a young woman, an adolescent girl, um, you know, it isn't, Gilligan would say. For an adolescent boy, uh, yeah, it, it could well be, but, but not for a girl. So uh, for the maturing female, Gilligan would say that moral problems uh, occur when there's a conflict of responsibilities. You know, I have a, con a responsibility to my friend, say, and a responsibility to my family, a responsibility to my uh, my community uh, and a responsibility to my friends. So uh, and that will put the, the female into a into a condition of stress uh, and a, provide a moral problem, uh, which is going to be very uncomfortable especially when caring uh, is involved. But for men, the moral dilemma is different. It's when there's a conflict of rights. So, um, you know, this person over here, my family has a right uh, to, to my involvement, to my defense, my protection, but also, uh, you know, my community uh, needs me as well. Uh, they have a right to my, um, my good behavior, my, my, my social contract, uh, my conscientiousness. So now, help, I'm in trouble, the stress here, my community and my family uh, both need me, um, uh, both have rights, which I, you know, am obliged to acknowledge, uh, and that's the source of my strength, uh, my, my stress. Uh, I, I think there's something in this, um, and, and I, I kind of like this. So um, Gilligan says, you know, uh, um, that, that the development for a woman, um, the, the stages that, that she goes through towards uh, maturity, uh, goes through selfishness, responsibility, self-sacrifice, and finally, ultimately, non-violence. So why am I talking about all of this? Well, simply because, you know, we're about to begin next week the serious work of looking at theological reflection. And um,
at the heart of the concept of theological reflection is that people change. You and I can change both in the elasticity, the, the plasticity of our brains, and also in our, our moral and spiritual reasoning and in our Christian development. Without that belief, then, then why on earth are we talking about theological reflection? You know, theology is important, and as we reflect on it, we will change. So, my hope is that over the, the the final seven or eight weeks that we have, you will uh, you will do some changing. You know, you as you do theological reflection, um, so so you will have a development and hopefully it is a progression, a maturity uh, of your convictions and of the way you see your own life, your own self awareness. Because theological reflection is about taking the events of your life and viewing them in the light of your Christian tradition and your community of faith. There's a, a nice little definition for you as we begin the serious work of, of looking at theological reflection, which we're going to start next week. And I want to leave you with a, a quotation about theological reflection by Roberta Bondi. And she says this. Theological reflection is a three way conversation among our ancestors in the church, my everyday experience and God. The conversation calls me to bring the whole of who I am, intellect and emotion, memory and hope, action and contemplate, contemplation, wounds and prayer in order that I may live out our common calling to love God and neighbour. Okay, I hope you found today interesting. Uh, for your assignment this week, um, I want you to uh, look back and what we've been doing the, these last couple of weeks about uh, the nature of, of theology. Um, and if somebody, uh, imagine a parishioner saying to you, uh, we don't need fancy theology. Uh, we just need to love God and obey the Bible. How do you respond? to that question in 500 words. So um, uh, you need to look back on what we did in Danville, I think, to, to look at the value of theology uh, and to work out what you would say to that person. So thank you for listening. Uh, good luck with that and look forward to all your contributions uh, on, the, um, on the discussion board as well.